Good morning again. Is it still a good morning? Um, I want to say a few thank yous just because it's good to be reminded of everything that goes on behind the scenes. Um, Sally, I would like to say thank you for your diligence in taking care of the food pantry, making sure that's always stocked and making it available to whoever needs it. Um, don't often talk about it. Often all you hear is, we need more food for the food pantry. That's a good thing because it means it's being used. So thank you, Sally, for your diligence and your work in there. Um, let's see, Kevin and Imelda, Christopher and Kayla, and Benji and Shay, thank you for your work with the, the youth group. Um, uh, yeah, let, let's just say thank you because uh, that is a huge ministry of this church. And the last year has been uh, bumpy as we've transitioned from the leadership of Trevor to the new guys. And I, I think they're doing a wonderful job, so thank you very much. Um, and Steve and Angie for your consistent week in and week out leading us in worship and, and just helping us to get our hearts and our, our minds right before the Lord. Thank you very much for your diligence in doing so. So... Not that that's all my thank yous. I have a lot of thank yous. We could spend the entire day doing thank yous. But uh, hopefully each week I'll get to remember a couple more. So, uh, we're going to take communion this morning. Um, you know, Scripture tells us to do this often in remembrance of, of Him. And Scripture, over and over and over again, Scripture tells us to remind them of these things, to remember these things. It's important. When it says remember, it says a reason for it. It's important. It's not for not. And so we want to take communion this morning. And, um, Paul, if I could get you to come, and Jason, if you would come and help hand out the, <coughs> the stuff. Um, Jason. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Jason in the black shirt on the third row. <laughs> That's okay. If you would go ahead and hand those out. Um, You know, I, I was contemplating the passage, do this often in remembrance of me, and I can't quite figure out, I wish he would have said, do this every two weeks, <laughs> or do this on the 30th of each month, or something, because, you know, I've been in churches where it's done every week, and after about the sixth or eighth week, you kind of you do it by rope, you don't really think about it anymore. And I've been in churches where it's done sporadically. There's no consistency in when it's done. It's just kind of when the wind strikes the pastor. And, you know, and, and we do it uh, typically on the first Sunday of each month. We, we choose the first Sunday of each month because it talks about fellowshipping together. And, and after our service, we, we fellowship here, and then we move next door, and we fellowship with the potluck, and we choose that intentionally. Um, but I, I wish we had a little more consistency, a little more clarity in this. Uh, I don't think there can be clarity, simply because what is often for you may not be often for me. Um, you know, I know for a period of time my family took communion every day. Every day. Um, I don't even remember how long. Probably, probably three or four weeks we took communion every day. Um, I don't know why. I was about that big. Mom said we're doing communion. All right, great news. You know, I mean... I, I, you guys are laughing, but that's what you guys are looking for. I know. But then there were other times where we went several months without having communion. So, um, often I think we, we need to look introspectively. Uh, Jason, could you get... I can believe so. The scripture tells us that on the night that he was to be betrayed, Jesus was partaking of the Last Supper, or, or the, the Passover. And, you know, this is one of those dichotomies we talked about last week, because we are celebrating something that if we truly understood the, the horrific nature of what it was, you wonder why we celebrate. 
because we're celebrating the broken body in the shed blood of our Lord and Savior. But, but we do this in remembrance of him because it was that broken body and that shed blood that was our deliverance. So on that night that he was to be betrayed, he gathered them together and he broke the bread and he passed it out. And he said, take and eat this bread. This is my body broken for you. So take the bread. And after they had eaten, he took the cup and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is a miracle. This is a wonderful, beautiful thing because see, we're not enslaved under the covenant of the law whereby we can never meet perfection. There's a new covenant where all of our sins, all of our transgressions are covered under this blood. And his righteousness is imputed to us giving us. So he said, take this, do this often and remember
Scripture reminds us that we are not to take communion in a manner unworthy. And uh, I think that's one of the interesting ironies of Scripture, because who of us is worthy? Really? It's because of this that we're worthy. So, um, you know, I, 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 it's one of those things that kind of makes my head hurt. No, I'm not worthy to take this, but because of you, I'm worthy to take this. So, um, uh, I just love the intricacy of God. And that he can make himself so simple that people like me can understand. So, we are continuing today with our testifying. And I have asked Mackenzie if she would come up and share her testimony. So, Mackenzie, if you would come up. I had to write it out because I figured as soon as I got up there, I'd forget it all. So, <laughs> um, Before we start, I'm not very eloquent, and I talk kind of fast, but by the grace of God, you will understand. <laughs> um, well, to start with, I have a very blessed life. Um, I have an incredible family. I have a church family that never ceases to amaze and bless me, and a God whose love for me never fails. Uh, I was born here in Montana, but when I was almost two, I moved to Katy, Texas, and then I moved back at like seven. And I remember always thinking that I was a Christian, and I never really questioned my faith because my family was Christian, and so I just assumed that it kind of went like that. But when we moved back to Montana, I began to take my faith more seriously and realize it wasn't really just going to church and being part of a Christian family. Um, I can remember multiple times when we moved back here, going to sleep in tears, asking Jesus to be my Savior. I didn't really understand what it meant, but I knew I needed something. But my faith never actually came to actuality because I think, I know now that I kept asking Jesus to be my savior, but I didn't make him my Lord. So I'd ask him to fix my problems, but then I'd live my life normally. I wouldn't change anything. Um, my salvation story actually starts with my brother's testimonies. Um, when I was 11, Benjamin, the brother who I fought with constantly back then, came back from Creation Music Festival with the youth group where he was saved. But when he came back, it wasn't the same Benjamin that had left. And um, I can specifically remember the day that I realized that he had changed, that he wasn't the same person we were. We got in an argument about something, I can't really remember what it was, and he wound up as if he was going to hit me. And then he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you're lucky I was saved. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like he came back perfect, but I knew that he was changed because before he would have just hit me anyway. So. <laughs> um, that really, I was like, wow, he's definitely a different person. And then when that really kind of spurred me on, but the one that really God really used was Donovan's salvation. He was saved at Promise Keepers in October, I think, of, 2000, of 2007. Um, on November 23rd, 2007, Mom and Dad were leading marriage group in our home work, and all the kids hung out downstairs. And I remember Don O'Bench and I got in this huge fight, and I don't really remember what it was about, something stupid again. And Donovan cried out of his window, and I locked myself in the bathroom, and <laughs> things were getting really bad. Um, Benj and Donovan, who were both just saved, quickly reconciled, and they were totally fine. And they're boys, they get over it, they punch each other, and they're fine. But I, I was still upset. And so Donovan took me into his room, and he apologized to me. And then by some odd chance, which I know now to be not odd chance at all, um, he started to talk about his testimony. And I remember, I had heard it all before, and I would said the prayer tons and tons of times, but... I remember thinking, because he started crying because he was telling me that he didn't want to see his baby sister go to hell. And I remember thinking, if this could make a teenage boy, which then in my mind was the toughest thing in the earth, except for my dad, <laughs> um, if this could make him cry, then it's something more serious than I thought about. And he, as he led me in the prayer, I had said it before tons and tons of times, but I remember thinking that I was rededicating my life. But I know now that I was actually giving my life to Jesus. And I felt, I felt different, and I came upstairs, and did mom and dad could tell that I'd be crying, and it, I thought that it had happened before, but this time it was, it was different, it was something really real. Um, so, I think what started my faith is more of a fear of hell, and a fear of the wrath of God, but as it says in Proverbs um, 9-10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, under, of wisdom, and, um, I think that I was kind of scared to my salvation, but as I grew, it became 
a fear and an awe and a love of my God. Um, so that's my salvation story, but I believe that testimony is not only what God, when God saved you, but what he's doing with your life now and what he has done with your life. And I remember I always used to think that it was just what God saved you out of, and I was always kind of disappointed because I would hear like Trevor or Pastor Kelly's testimony where God saved them miraculously and they were doing all these terrible things and then they would like stop them cold turkey and thinking that my testimony wasn't all that great. But I know now that God is not what God saved me out of, it's what he saved me from. Mm -hmm. um, and I also came to realize that if I was disappointed in my testimony, it was as if I was saying that God's most amazing miracle in my life wasn't worth it, and I was ashamed of it. So I learned to think differently about it. Um, but what God has done in my life, he's, he's kept me from so many things, and he's blessed me beyond my imagination. But I take after my dad, and I'm a perfectionist. And I tend to get very frustrated with my faith, because I see, here's point A where I'm at, and I, point B is where I'm supposed to be. And I can't figure out how to get there. And I always get mad at myself because I can't do it in my own flesh, and then I get frustrated because I try and do it in myself, and then things build and build and build. Um, but I remember there was one time that I was really struggling with this, and my dad brought me aside and he said, he kind of explained to me how it's not Mackenzie who's living anymore. It's Jesus who's living through me. And my life is nothing to do with me. It's all about Jesus. And so for a while he would remind me when things were getting frustrating. Mackenzie, are you along for the ride? I mean, it's not you anymore. You're not driving your life. You're just along for the ride. And so I've had to learn to just go along for the ride. And that's a whole lot more difficult than it sounds. <laughs> um, I have also have had to learn to memorize a saying, God does not call the equipped. He equips the call. Because there have been many things that he has put me into you that I feel like, God, what are you doing? Like, I can't do this. For instance, like playing bass. Sundays up here in front of you guys. In my own strength, I could not do that. Playing piano for the youth group and leading the youth group, I could not do that in my own strength. And I always would get scared and think, God, what are you doing? I'm not a good enough musician for this. I'm not a good enough leader for this. And he would, again, remind me, I do not call the equipped. I equip the call. And I think that's why he's called me, is because I know I cannot do it in my own self. But then I get frustrated because I try and do it in my own flesh. And so, it's just this ongoing cycle, but as I grow and mature, he teaches me and encourages me and it helps me to just understand more of how to give myself up. Um, one thing that I've learned about my testimony that I think really is the biggest thing, like I said before, I was always kind of disappointed in it, but I, well, when I was writing this last night, I looked up the word testimony in the dictionary, and it says evidence or proof provided by the existence or appearance of something. And so, I kind of realized last night that, like, Trevor and Pastor Kelly's testimony, there is this evidence or proof of how great of a Savior Jesus is. My testimony is more of a proof of how great of a Lord He is, and how He didn't have to rescue me out of something because He leads me so well out of that stuff. And, um, so yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> it's always interesting and unique to hear your family member's testimony. To see all the things you missed. Because quite honestly, when she came upstairs and she was crying, I wasn't thinking about salvation. I was thinking, okay, which one of your brothers do I have to beat? <laughs> um, um, we're, we're taking a little bit of a break today. I'm going to step away from Colossians for a week. Um, I was struggling with some issues. By the way, I thank you very much for your prayers this week, just past week. Uh, they were very obviously present in my life. And uh, I think because of that, this is your fault that we have today's message. <laughs> I'm, I'm laying all blame all on you. But I was contemplating some things about my life and my walk. And 
you know, TJ, I don't appreciate you telling me about God bringing you back and realizing what an ugly person you are, because it made me start thinking about myself and, and going into it. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I... You ever get tired of looking in the mirror and seeing yourself? I mean, not, not even physically, but I mean looking in the mirror of your life and just seeing yourself. And, you know, one of my, my passions is I want someday, before God takes me home, to look in the mirror and see more of Jesus than I see of me. Um, because there's a lot of me. And uh, contemplating and praying and, and, and uh, just meditating on some things, I, I felt led to share this with you. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Jesus is talking, and he says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. But when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him for, to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now there's some things that I want to draw out of this that I want to share with you. See, all of the virgins were waiting for their Lord to come. All of them believed themselves to be his. Uh, they were all there together. And, and even maybe to the discerning, there was no difference between them. There's a virgin, she has a lamp. There's a virgin, she has a lamp and a flask. And I want to ask you today, what is your oil? What is your oil? Because, see, we stand, we, when I came up this morning, I, I talked a little bit about the eager anticipation with which we wait for Jesus to come back for his return. But are our lamps burning? Do we have sufficient oil in our lives to keep those lamps burning? When he comes back, is he going to see in our lives burning lamps? Or are we going to have to say, wait, time out. i got to get some things straight first. I'm lacking in an area. Give me a moment. See, the, he ends this saying, no one knows the day or the hour. And I laugh at all these mathematicians and these scholars that sit down and go, oh yeah, it's going to be September whatever. Well, hey, you got a one in three and a, 365 and a quarter days to be right. Any fool can do that. Jesus even goes so far, far as to say, I don't even know. Only the Father knows. And we're going to have you, Jesus? Come on. Let's let Scripture be what Scripture is. The truth. Okay? When he says you don't know something, it's because you don't know. Okay? 
So we have to be prepared. Now, I want to share with you another parable that Jesus told. So flip over with me uh, to Luke chapter 12. Now, my, my Bible has subheadings over each of the different sections. Does anybody else have subheadings? Okay, right before verse 35, what does it say for the subheading? To be in readiness. To be in readiness. Mine says, you must be ready. Okay? So, starting in verse 35, I'm going to read. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Interesting, because he's not talking about the virgins here. Keep your lamps burning. You know, like that song, we, we don't take our light and hide it under a bushel. No. We're going to let it shine. Okay. You think <coughs> lamps, letting your light shine is important? Okay. Pay attention. Keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, this is not where we're stopping. We're going on. Okay? So you get the idea, the gist. We've got to be ready. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant when his master will find, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, now this is where we have to pay attention. Okay? Perk your ears up. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant, who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what, des uh, did, and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. See, this, this should rattle your hops. Okay? This should get your attention. Because I, I want to go through some lists here. We have sins in church that are obvious. There are gross sins. Okay? We have things like addiction to illicit drugs and addiction to alcohol and addictions to pornography and we have adultery and we have uh, beatings and, and, and we have uh, thieves and we look at those things and we go no evil shun okay the gross sins now the obvious sins now I say they're obvious because anybody that sees that knows that it's a sin now, we talked last week a little bit about posers. Now, you can be doing those things and still be sitting comfortably in the chair here today. I hope not, maybe not so comfortably. You can hide them. Okay? But God will out. God will out. The gross sins, we, we see those and we automatically classify them. And as a Christian, we go, no, we don't do these. We are not earmarked by these. But see, then there's a whole other set of sins that I call the wink-wink sins. Okay? 
And it's the ones we just kind of wink our eyes at. It's like, yeah, got it. Okay. And, and we get into these sins, and we start, whoops, excusing them. Well, nobody's perfect. Well, at least it's not one of the big sins. See, sin is sin is sin is sin. Sin is that which separates you from God. We like to classify them, to quantify them, to qualify them. Well, I'm not so far removed from God as that person. Did you catch that? You just declared yourself removed from God. Okay? What does sin mean? You shot at the target, you shot at the bullseye, and you missed. Okay? See, the only way in is to get the bullseye. None of us can hit the bullseye in and of ourselves. So, we have the wink-wink sins. Gossip. Did you hear and I think I know why. You know, even the foolish is considered wise when they shut up. Really? You know? Let them speculate on whether or not you're an idiot. Don't open your mouth and prove them right. Right? God tells us this in His Word. If you want to be thought wise, shut up. Quit talking. That's why He gave you two ears and one mouth. Twice as much listening as talking. Okay? Gossip. You know that gossip is one of the seven things that God despises? Loose lips. He despises it. But we... Oh! Well, what really is gossip. I mean, uh, you know, it's not really like it's malicious. Does it need to be talked about? For any other reason than your own gratification, does it need to be talked about? No? Shut up. I know a lot of you parents, you, you don't like that term with your kids. My kids are used to it. <laughs> okay? Shut your mouth. Quit talking. Now, see, the reason... I'm not pointing fingers at you guys because this next one, it's, another, it's a huge wink wink. And I'm guilty. How about love me? <laughs> you realize that's another one that God despises. I don't know why. I don't know why. But God says he hates it. He hates it. We got churches that, oh Lord, if you smoke, you cannot be a deacon. I can't find a passage on smoking in here. I can find passages for inference, but I can't find one that talks about smoking. But I can find a buttload of them that talk about stuff in your face. Wink, wink. What about other addictions? Now, you know, we look, oh yeah, he's addicted to narcotics, or he's addicted to this, or she's addicted to that. What about caffeine? Uh-oh. How many toes did I just step on? I'm stepping on my own. Ow. <laughs> All right. Caffeine is a drug. But it's a weak, weak drug. Energy drinks. Sugar. How about sugar? How about anything that you cannot put down? That you can't walk away from? How about it? How about lust? How about lust? I've been married faithfully for 47 years. How many times did you think about it and just never have the opportunity? 
Now see, when you think about it, you've done it. Lust, lust of the heart. We, we think that maybe if nobody knows, it's okay. Nobody got hurt. You did. You did. Because you have removed yourself from God's blessing, His grace. Wink, wink. What about those things? You see, when you come into the body of Christ, when you accept salvation, Mackenzie said it very clearly. You don't get Him just as Savior. He's Lord. And the Lord has laid down certain guidelines, certain parameters under which He expects His body to operate. Okay? I mean, think about this. Your brain keeps this body going in the direction that you want it to, mostly. Mostly. Sometimes gravity asserts itself. Just our natural clumsiness or whatever. Okay? But think about this. What would happen if each part of your body had a mind of its own? And they refused to talk to each other? <laughs> really? Why do you think there are parameters? Do you think it's because God wants to contain you in this little box and he sits up there and laughs and goes, ah, I took away all their fun. God knows how to have fun. Okay? Think about this for a minute. What was the first miracle that Jesus did? Where? Wedding, wedding feast. He's at a party. He's at the wedding reception. He didn't turn his nose up at it. Oh, there might be fun there. <laughs> I'm wearing my robe. And we do not have fun. <laughs> he, he didn't do that. As a matter of fact, his mom comes in. You gotta love moms. <laughs> okay, she comes to him and says, Hey son, they're running out of wine. Can you do one of those things you do? <laughs> woman? And he calls her that woman? <laughs> this, this, mom! <laughs> Really? That's what you want me to do? And what, what did she do? She, she takes it upon herself to help him. Hey, go get every jar and fill it with water and bring it to him. Bring it. And what did Jesus do? He turned the water into wine, not just, just wine. The best wine. Okay? So we know that God knows how to part. All right? What's the first thing we're going to do when he takes us home? The marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, before Jesus left, what did he say about wine? I will not drink again of this cup until that day. So we are going to get together with Jesus and have a party. So it's not like God is looking down and saying, let's keep him in this tightly controlled box in which fun is not allowed. Okay? But the parameters are set for what reason? For his benefit? For our benefit. For our benefit. Did you know that eating six boxes of Twinkies is not a good idea? <laughs> did you know that? How did you know that? It wouldn't have anything to do with the Surgeon General warning, would it? Five and a half boxes, okay, six, no. I mean, really. God desires a people to function efficiently and well. He desires, what does he say? I know my plans for you. They are not plans for evil, but they are plans for good. To what to you? Prosper you. Now, does that mean you're going to have lots of money? Maybe. Maybe not. There's a whole bunch of other ways to prosper. Matter of fact, I think most of us don't prosper when we have money. We get stupid. We get frivolous. We're poor stewards. Now see, the manager here is what I want to warn us about. I want to talk to us about. Because see, you come into salvation and there's an excitement and there's a fervor and there's a burn. And then the discipline starts. Because see, we come in, God has not called us to be converts. 
He's called us to be disciples. Disciples. Sharing the root word of discipline. Those who discipline their lives to a certain teaching. Okay? So he has called us to be disciples. And once the glow of conversion fades, <coughs> the work happens. Now see, one of the other parables that Jesus tells is that, you know, we have to consider the cost. He said, who of you is going to lay the foundation for a great building and then not have the resources to build it? Won't he then be made fun of, be mocked? Which of you, uh, if you had an army of 10,000, would go to war with a king with an army of 20,000? Wouldn't you rather go out and make peace before his army comes and annihilates you? See, one of the things that we don't often do in the church is we don't tell people the cost. The cost. Because, see, you can do nothing to earn your salvation. Our salvation is the way of the cross. It's death. Okay? It was his death on the cross. It's your death every day. Remember, he tells us to take up our cross daily. It's not a one and done. He also tells us that we will suffer persecution. We will go through trials. You're going to face hardship. If you're not going through trials, one of two things is going on. First, get ready, because you will be. Or second, Check whose family you belong. Because God disciplines his children. He brings trials on them. Why? To hurt them? To beat them? You know? I mean, God's up there, like the angry sheriff.
not yours. So the one that had three brings three more. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Now what did he tell to these two after that? He didn't just stop right there. What did he tell them? Enter your master's rest. See, it wasn't a matter of just doing the work. There was a reward at the end. There is a reward at the end. There is a reward that is coming. But to the one that didn't do anything, he brings back the talent and he says, Here, I, I, I knowing you're a hard master, I buried it. Cover my rump. So here, here's what is yours. Did the master have anything good to say to that servant? Oh, gosh, I really appreciate you. Bring him back what's mine. No. What did he do? Take it away from him. Give it to the one who had ten. And throw him out in the utter darkness where there will be weeping and lashing, gnashing of teeth. Throw him out. Listen, you will give an accounting to everything that God has given you. And I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about what God has given you. What has God given you? How about everything? How about there is nothing in your life that God did not give you that is not directly from His benevolent hand? And one day, he will come back. And if we're dilly-dallying with his goods, he's going to come in and he's going to demand an accounting. And he's going to want to know what we give him what he gave us. See, that's all part of looking in the mirror and seeing Jesus. More of him, less of me. Day by day, more of him, less of me. More of him, less of me. Look, the only reason you see yourself in front of the mirror is because you feel like you've got something to give. Like you've got something. Something that we desperately hold on to and cling to. Those things that separate us from him. Okay? That remove me from the, the fullness of his presence. When he comes into your dark room and says, hey, let's turn on the light. No, 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 no. Oh, oh. Please keep that off. This room's not ready for you yet. Look, you can do nothing to clean that room. The only one that can clean it is the one that wants to turn on the light. Let him clean it. Let him come in and get rid of whatsoever he will, no matter how cool you think it is. No matter how precious you think it is. No matter how long that item has been in your life. Jesus, you don't understand. I've had that since I was seven years old. Yeah, it's got to go. But, 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 it's got to go. Now listen. You're perfect. The blood of Jesus Christ, if you have asked Him into your life as Lord and Savior, if you have given up the reins of your life, you're perfect before God. Those sins that you commit are covered. But He is still making us perfect. He's still making us holy. He's still pulling out that garbage, pulling out the refuse. He's still recreating us. See, He, he wants us to look like the perfect image of man, not the first Adam, the second, the one who had opportunity to sin and did not sin. Not the one that had opportunity to sin and guess what? He took it. So, what is the oil in your life? What is it that is keeping you, that is hindering you, that is holding you back? I run out of it. I gotta go get some more. What is it that is causing you 
to have not as good a relationship with your Savior as you should, as you could. What is it? Are you being a good manager of the resources that God has put at your disposal? Are you doing everything you can so when that day comes and we present our crowns to Him, it's radiant and beautiful? Or are you content with pig iron? Well, I braided it. When you stand before Him, do you want to hear Him say, Well done. Well done. You did good, kid. See, that's part of being a disciple. Being disciplined to the life that he has called us to. Living in the parameters that he has set so that you can live a good life. I'm not talking about having the five-bedroom, three-bath house. I'm not talking about driving the newest model car. I'm talking about regardless of what situation, circumstance, life, as you win at this moment, you have peace. You have joy. When ugly things come upon you, you're not phased. You're not ugly. That when good things come upon you, you don't turn ugly. Because I've seen that. I've seen that so many times. People are generous with their money when they have none. But as soon as they get some, they don't want to share it. Not in this church. We got a generous church here. I'm serious. We have a generous church here. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an honesty that I'm sharing. But personally, I, I don't understand why that is. What's your oil? What is it that could be causing you a problem? What is it that is preventing you from having the life that God wants you to have. Uh, this makes sense to me, okay? God who knows everything knows where the brambles are, knows where the vipers are, knows every part of the path, the bumps, the dips, And me that stumbles around blind in this light, going, oh, <laughs> there's that patch of brambles, as I extract myself from them. There's a viper in that hole, I know. I just stuck my hand in. I can't walk across my backyard without falling down. And I think that I have some kind of ability better than God's to direct my life. To determine how my life is going to go. Really? Because that's what I tell him daily. I'm going to do this. And God says, well, go ahead. All right, now, now you want to listen to me now? Okay, wipe the mud off. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, God, help me out. I take a couple tottering steps, and then I feel like I got it again. And down I go. I'll tell you what. That speaks marvelous things about his patience. Because after a while, you know, when my grandchildren first learned to walk, after a while I just sit among the romps. Just stay down for a while. God picks us back up, puts us back on our feet. Okay? So what's the oil in your life? What is it that is hindering you, that is causing you any kind of separation? Keep in mind, I'm not talking salvation here. I'm speaking to those that are saved. What is it that is preventing you from having jewels in your crown? From having something to throw at his feet, to lay before him? What is it that is making it so that when you stand before him, he may not say, well done. He may say, you know what, you made it. Go. Pass. I want him to be pleased with my work, with what I've done. I want him to, to be happy with the life that I've led. Amen?